Hello and welcome back to Insemination. I am unbelievably so excited for our next episode, so I want to get right to it. Our next guest is a donor-conceived advocate, and not just a donor-conceived advocate, but one of our top advocates that we have. So let's get right to the episode and introduce you to Cassandra Adams. And welcome to the studio, Cassandra. You are my very first guest in studio. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me on this beautiful day in New York City. It is. We are trapped in a basement and it is absolutely glorious outside. I am yeah. very sorry about that. That's okay. Maybe you could like, you know, put like some nice tree-lined streets behind us or something. Ah, uh, yes. The the incredible <laughs> Manhattan landscape. I mean, we don't have the orange death sky anymore. Which That's was, true. God, that was terrifying. Oh, it was, it was really scary. But... <laughs> Um, so let, let us get into it. You are a donor conceived person. You are an advocate. You are, uh, uh, you are such a strong advocate for the donor conceived community. I think you are sort of, when someone finds out they're donor conceived, you kind of are the first person that sort of says hi. You're kind of like, hey, you, you're the first person to greet. You are like kind of that nice warm hug that I feel like every donor conceived person kind of gets to see. You are also actively working um, with the industry, with ASRM to like get them to fucking huck a buck and get them to start listening to us. You're also an amazing um, Jewish advocate, which I, God, I love. Um, so all around, you're you're just sort of like one of those like core foundational people within our community, which is just so sparkling, and I'm so glad that you're here, and I'm so excited for you to tell your story. Thank you so much. Thank you. I hope to be that warm hug for everybody. Well, you actively are. <laughs> I, I, I try. You're our evergreen advocate. You are good for all seasons. I've never heard anyone say a bad word about you. You're the one who gets along with everybody, uh, which I am not that person. Uh, I am I am not the one that gets along with everybody. Um, uh, this is when we we cut to me in 2022 at the ASRM convention, basically like holding my middle finger up to all of the industry, being like, <laughs> fuck you guys and take some responsibility. I literally said that to a table full of uh, industry amazing. people. I was it's just amazing. like, fuck you guys. You are well loved. See, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I, that was that was me at my most loving. I totally no regrets, no regrets. It needed to happen, but I'm like, yeah. I, I, I let's just say I'm not gonna be asked back. It's definitely gonna be you. Uh, you're the one who who's a little bit nicer and is like, okay, let's let's figure this all out. But let's start from the very beginning. Oh my gosh. So, um, I was born in 1982, and Yay, I just... 80s, baby! Yes, yes, 82! So good! Such a good year. Mm -hmm. um, and I just grew up in a tr regular family, what I thought, in the New Jersey suburbs, you know, mom, dad. Um, and I was really always the family genealogist. Mm -hmm. The family tradition keeper, the one who asked questions about the family and was interested and carried on the traditions and all that kind of stuff, even from childhood. What was your family's like background? Your the family that you were obviously raised with, yes. and um, so like what what was your family's ethnicity heritage? What yeah. how did how did they identify? So my mom is Italian American. Mm -hmm. My mom was conceived over in Italy and born here in Brooklyn. Where in Italy was she conceived? San Bartolomeo in Galdo. That. Provincia di Benevento. Oh. <laughs> oh, that. I was not ready for that, for you to just like go, whoop, boom. Oh, that was cool. Okay. <laughs> I miei nonni sono cugini. My grandparents are cousins. Um, very small little town. Um, so I very much knew that, that side of my family. I grew up my whole life hearing about the town my grandparents were from, um, Italian spoken in the house, all of that. Um, Are you fluent in Italian? Not not as fluent as I want to be. I can get by in Italy. I okay. can get by in Italy. Um, All right. Well, yes. next next trip to Italy, we're bringing Cassandra. That's yes. what's happening. Yes. Okay. I have told my story in Italian, actually. Are you serious? I have, yes. That yes. sounds pretty there's, freaking fluent to me. There's a, Oh, I had to practice. There's a beautiful um, psychologist in Italy, uh, Valentina Berruti. And um, she is a mother via egg donation, mm -hmm. which is v a very new thing in Italy that they okay. just allowed. Um, and she's also a psychologist. And so she's 
doing the work in Italy to try to get parents uh, via Amazing. donor conception to be uh, honest from the beginning and open and stuff because there it's it's still in its infancy kind of. Valentina? Yes, Valentina. Valentina, I love you, girl. Yes. She's, Hell yes. She's lovely. So, yes. You're getting love from over here. That's amazing. <laughs> So yeah, so that was that was um, kind of the the culture I grew up in. My my dad, who raised me, is uh, really uh, American. Um, um, I would always ask like my him and my grandparents like, so what are you guys? Because I knew my mom's side so well, and I was always like, what are you guys? And they just I don't know, we're Dutch or something. Mm -hmm. Like there's, um, oh, uh, not as much. Uh, of a vibrant culture on that side. Okay. Um, but as I got older. Well, you know, the culture of assimilation. Ex yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Uh -huh. As I got older, um, and then Adams is my maiden name. So okay. that's my dad's uh, my dad's name. So it's a very, very British last name, you know. Um, and as I got older, I connected with some of my dad's uh, cousins and everything. Mm -hmm. And I started to do research on, on his family tree. So I found out, you know, there's a very long line, you know, some uh, British colonists in the 16th hundreds in New England. Um, my uh, grandmother was actually a Wyckoff, which is a big name in Brooklyn, one of the original um, Dutch families in New, okay. in New Amsterdam in like the 1600s. So that was my dad's family. Very cool. Okay. Very colonial America. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but we know the wrench that's coming. Yeah. Some, know? Somehow that's <laughs> not what showed up when I took a DNA test. How old were you when you took a DNA test? I was 34 when I spit in the tube. Oh, okay, so we have another geriatric discovery. Exactly. Another I'm geriatric. part of I'm part of the 35 club. Somehow there's like this whole group of people who found out at in 35. their third. Yeah, yep, the yep. 30s were definitely a real hotbed of a time. Mm, yeah, real. Yes. I, I've had like so many guests on that have been like, "Yep, found out in the 30s," and yep. it was like, "Ugh, yep. yeah, finding out yep. in the 30s that's a tough round." Okay, it's so it's so tough. So I, I did a DNA test with 23andMe. Mm -hmm. um, it was something I really always kind of wanted to do, but they used to be very expensive. And then um, a friend was like, they're doing a research study and on depression. And I you was were like, like gotcha. I was like, wait, that's me. <laughs> I'm like, I am oh. depression. <laughs> I love it because it's just like, I'm so glad that that made you think of me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> So, but it was Genetics like. Genetics and depression. I know. It's just like, it was just perfect. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, this is great. I can help, you know, as a psych major, I can help the field of psychology and, and get my uh, DNA test. Amazing. And for free, you know. Um, and my, my dad had a very long history of uh, psychological problems like depression and anxiety as well, which I thought was inherited from him. We'll, we'll, we'll circle back we'll to that. We'll circle back to that. But yeah. um, so, uh, you know, that was that was part of the research study was the, the you know, biological basis and mm -hmm. the heritability of, of, of uh, depression. So um, when I get my results back, September 26th of 2017, it was two weeks before my, um, third, oh my, God, uh, my 35th birthday. Ago. I know. 2017. That's not long yep, ago. Yep. It'll be six years in a couple months. Jeez. Okay. Um, the first thing I saw when I opened my test results was... Um, 49 point something percent Ashkenazi Jewish. What is up? Hello. Hello. Yes, the the Ashkenazi <laughs> Discovery Club. Yeah. There's a good few of us. There really are. There, there really, really are. are. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I know I'm already going to get a lot of comments going like, are you sure you guys aren't related? Yes. Yeah. We're not. We're not. <laughs> we, trust me, we would have known. We yes. are not related. But we uh, should check to see if we have any Centimorgans, though, because a lot of people should. with Ash, Ash, all Ashkenazi Jews are are distantly related. Can you explain what centimorgans are? <gasps> centimorgans are um, the amount of DNA that you share with a person. So basically, whenever you take like an Ancestry or 23andMe, you're always going to see like a, a percentage of DNA shared with a person or amount of centimorgans shared. Exactly. So that that's what it is referring to. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, many, many Ashkenazi Jews will share very small amounts of, of centimorgans with one another because... All Ashkenazi Jews are descended from about 300, 400 people oh, no. originally. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so that was the first thing I saw. And um, not what I expected. Mm -mm. Um, and But, of course, you know, as I've learned, your trust for your family story um, 
is kind of what comes out first when you get these these results and you kind of try to uh, uh, frame your results within within what you know. So, um, you know, the first thing I thought was my my grandfather, my Italian grandfather, you know, um, had lived in Brooklyn. You know, the Italians and the Jews were living close to one another at that point. And um, my grandfather loved, loved, loved his Jewish neighbors, always liked to, to talk about um, about that uh, and, grow, you know, living in Brooklyn. And um, so my first thought was maybe my grandfather was was part Jewish. And that was his, you know, his, okay. his affinity for the culture. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, one of my friends was asking, like, oh, were there any, tra-? you know, sometimes there there is a group of, of um, Jews in Italy who, ha- you know, forced conversions and things like yeah. that where they carried on some traditions. Mm-hmm. So my friend who I shared the results with, like after midnight and I'm trying to figure this out, was like, well, did you know, did your family do this or do that? And I'm like, I don't know. Like trying to figure out yeah, if maybe they were, you know, forced conversions. Um, but as the night wore on, mm, mm-hmm. I, I I realized, okay, I'm half Jewish. Well, you know, that doesn't really explain if it was just my grandfather. That'd have to be my grandmother too. Um, and then I'm thinking, you know, my dad had somebody in his family from Germany, a great grandmother, maybe she was. And I'm trying to add up these percentages, mm-hmm. right? And finally, it's like three, four in the morning. And my friend who I'm discussing this with is like, Cassandra, you know, you, your last name is Adams. You know that your dad is primarily like British. Like that's the the thing, you know, he probably has the largest percentage mm-hmm. of. You're zero percent British. And that. that oh, that. that <laughs> how much of the wind was knocked out of yeah, you at that, that moment? That That's when I really realized that. Um. It was 50 percent Jewish and the other 50 percent was um, consistent with Southern Italy because, you know, at the time, you know how they refine the results. Yeah. So at the time it was like 25 percent Southern Europe, 20 percent Middle East. There was like a little bit of Spain, a little bit of France. But that was all consistent with Southern Italy. And now it's all been, you know, melded into into Southern Italy. But um, um, so that's when I realized something was very wrong. Um, And I I, I told my mom. that I needed to talk to her over messenger in the middle of the night. Oh, no. And she was awake in the middle of the night and gave me a thumbs up because um, she knew that I got the results because I, I messaged her when I got the results. And I was like, oh, mommy, you need to take the test, too, because I think little Nona might have been part Jewish. Like that was literally the oh, first thing. Oh, my God. Thing. Oh, my God. And so she knew. How did she knew it was coming? How, how, how did she react when she found out that you were taking the test? Um, I actually, you know, you have those memories come kind of flood back. Yeah. Um, and I, I, she was actually there when I was spitting into the tube and I, I remember the look on her face and she kind of looked sick. Really? Yeah. yeah. She, she, she couldn't stop it. She was like, it's, it's, I don't, it's ma- happening. maybe it'll get switched. Maybe, mm-hmm. maybe I'll just will it for the genetics to change. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So the thumb, thumbs up, thumbs up. And, and then what happened? And she came over the next morning. She was going to watch my daughter while I had an appointment. Um, and, uh, she sat down on the couch and I said, Mommy, what's what's going on? You know, I said, He's he's not my father, is he? Oh my god. And that's when she started crying. She's like, No, he's not. Oh my are you <laughs> thinking like this is an affair at first? You know, that was the th- so I I am a goody two shoes and my mom is a goody two shoes. My mom's most important advice to me was don't do anything before you get married. Mm-hmm. Um, only with the man that you marry. And that was what she swore up and down for her. That's what she made sure that I, <laughs> that I valued. Um, and uh, so I was like, that. that's not possible. You know, like I, okay. I, I, I kind of figured, I mean, I know a lot of people will say that about their moms, but I truly believe that yeah. she, she really didn't uh, do anything with anyone else. So I was like, what happened? Like mm-hmm. just what, how? Um, and then she said that my dad had been um, infertile. And so they used a sperm donor. And that's when everything kind of came like. Was that down. the like the. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That was that, yeah. because that's when it was. That's when it was real. Yeah. That's when it was confirmed by by the person who knew. Oh, my God. Yeah. And was it through a clinic or a cryobank? <laughs> no, it was just her. Her OBGYN getting samples from his colleagues at the hospital. Oh, 
was just like one of my half brothers so, calls him like the dealer. Like there was like yeah. a, a doctor who was like the dealer. Like honest, I I do think a lot of that. I mean, but that's how it was. So yeah. much of it, yeah. it was this giant masturbatorium of doctors essentially yeah. calling up like, "Hey, who's free for five minutes?" Exactly. I mean, that's what I do think that um you know my my donor because you know with the with the people that we because so far with the siblings I've been able to communicate with, it's been different doctors. And so yeah. I think he just went in just being like, yeah, who needs who needs a Philip? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. Okay. So So they had no info. I was like, mommy, who, what? Like anything. And she's like, I don't know. I didn't get you know, like she had no paperwork. She was never given any paperwork. Um as far as she knows, it was never like written in her chart or anything. It was it was it was a secret operation. <laughs> you know? Um and so she, you know, the, I had did anyone in your family know or nope. just her and my dad. None of my grandparents knew um, her, my dad and the doctor. That was it. Oh, my God. Yeah. I and... could see the weight kind of come off of her when she told me to. It was a long 35 year secret for her as well. That's what I that's what I, I you know, try to tell parents too. like it's not even fair to yourself no. to keep this kind of secret. It's, no. it's burdensome on you, too. Yeah. It will damage always, it does to you is just awful. You will always be scared for the rest of your life of yes. are they going to find out? Yeah. Who's going to tell them? Are they going to find out? Are they going to like it's always it's never going to be good. Yeah. Um you always yeah there's oh my god. Uh okay. So you had the conversation with your mom and then when was your dad brought into the mix? Um I think my mom had told him. Okay. Um he was not in a good frame of mind at the time. There mm. were some other things going on okay. uh, where he was, uh, as I said, he had a you know, history of, of mental health problems. So he was okay. already in not a good place at the time. Ooh, OK. <laughs> so that wasn't wasn't uh, ideal. But of course, it's never ideal. I wasn't in a good place in my life at that point either. So it was just all on, all in all. That's the thing, too. If you don't tell your, your children, you have no control over when the secret comes out. Yeah. And it's usually at a terrible time. Oh, it, not it, that it's ever a really good no, time, but, but it's usually at like the worst time. It will always be a bad time. Like yeah. if, if you if your child is a late discovery, it will always come out at a. And the longer you wait, mm -hmm. the worst it will the the worse yeah. it will get. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, we see that all the time. All the time. It's going to come out at a deathbed. It's going to yes. come out during a divorce. Mm -hmm. They're going to just accidentally find out by taking a DNA test. Yeah. Um, a upset aunt who's drunk is going to tell them. Yeah. It literally, it, it's going to be, uh, a, the sibling is going to find out first and then angrily call their other sibling and tell them. Like, yeah. it's just, it, it. this always happens. Exactly. Um, and these are, and the, everything I just said has happened. Like, these are yes. all very oh, true yes. stories. Yeah. Okay, so you find out, and then how, how are, you, what is your emotional journey then from, like, uh, how, what are those yeah. steps yeah. of uncovering? So I had matched with a half sibling. Okay. <laughs> um. So uh, my mom had given me a couple little uh, clues of, of what she remembered. Okay. Which were, um, they're humorous to look back on. But <laughs> so she told me, and this is all during 15 minutes, like before I left for my appointment that I had to go to. Nice. <laughs> um, you know, she told me that she remembered that one of the days that she was inseminated because she came in like three days during the week she was fertile. Mm -hmm. Um that the doctor, you know, came in with the sample and was like, oh, I just drove over from Long Island with this. And, my, you know, my parents were in Westchester County. So um, that was literally my first like image of myself. My, my you know, was was uh, like a cup, like uh, like a doctor with the window down, like driving over like the Throgs Neck Bridge or something with like a cup of semen in the cup holder. So, yes, yeah, so that was like my first image of myself. And I was like, oh, oh. so. Yeah, but that was the info that she had. And also the whole like, oh, they said they were using medical students, that whole thing, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And so when I went back to this half sibling match that I had and I Googled um, the name and what happened was there were um, three doctors on Long Island with that last name. So I was like, oh, Long oh. Island and doctor. Well, that just fits in. Um, and mm -hmm. so I, I wrote to this half sibling match within like 48 hours. Of course. And I was like, I, I think that maybe you're the child that 
my biological father raised and I just found this out and I'm a mess and I just, I, I don't want anything. I just want some health history, maybe a little family history and I, I'm willing to be your friend and you know, whatever. Yep. Um, and she thankfully wrote back very quickly. Um, and it turns out that um, his raised children had had just found out that he had donated sperm about a oh month before God. that because someone had popped up on Ancestry. So, so yeah. So, um, and and she confirmed that it was her her dad, her her dad who raised wow. her, who had who had donated sperm, and who oh was my, my biological father. So to have one of the raised kids, I mean, I know it's an adult at the time, yeah. um, but to have one of them step up like that. Is yes. always so heartwarming for our community. It is because there's so many of them who blame the donor conceived person. Yes, exactly. And you know the feelings of like upset at like their dad, their mom, their parent for for donating and not telling them. Yeah, they you know it's safer to take that anger out on us yeah. than on the parent. Exactly. Um, and it is something that I don't think a lot of donors really and people realize that being. Donor conception does not just affect the donor conceived person, does not just affect the recipient parent. It also affects the donor's whole family as well. Yeah, yeah, the entire family. And you're donating when you're 19, you're you're 20, you're not thinking about that. And then it's, you stop thinking about it, a lot of them do, and then suddenly they're 40 years old and they're like, oh yeah, sure, I'll go on. And they don't even realize it. And like their kid is on Ancestry. Exactly. And suddenly gets this like, oh shit, I have 50 siblings, dad. What the hell is going on? Yep. yep. Um, I remember having this incredible conversation with an egg donor who donated eggs, done, okay. And then like, I want to say like 20 years later, she was um, like just watching her kids play, her, her, her raised children and realizing like, I have more kids out there. I have more kids out there, and she's watching her children play going, my kids here that I'm looking at are fine. Are my other kids not okay? Did they go to good homes? Are they being abused? Are they all right? Yeah. I don't, and she suddenly like, it was like, again, it was that like, boom moment. And she just was like, are they okay? What if they need me? What if they're not okay? And she just yes. suddenly was like, holy shit. Yes, exactly. And I do, th and it's like all these kinds of like, holy shit moments that happened that happen later on because there is not proper counseling. There is not proper information that no. is ever shared with the recipient parents or especially the donors. No. No. Um, and it hits donors like a ton of bricks. Yeah. And, but I'm so off topic right now, but I'm just, no, I'm very no, grateful it's that, so true. but I'm so grateful that your donors raised child stepped up and was kind and warm and welcoming to you. That really is yes. awesome. Cause that's, yes. that is rare. It really is. So I was very quickly connected with um, her older brother, who mm -hmm. I met with him, and um, then given kind of my bio dad's information, wow, and was able to uh, email with him, um, and then meet him uh, four months after I found out. How was it like meeting your donor? <laughs> or how do you want me to refer to him? Donor, oh, biological my father, biological father, usually. Biological father. Yeah. How was it meeting meeting your bio father? Um, it was it was like meeting. Myself. <laughs> so the genetic mirroring kicked <laughs> it in was, really hard? It, it was huge. It was huge. There was a huge, huge um, amount of grief after after I met him because oh. I was – there was so much um, of myself yeah. in him or really so much of him in me. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, and so it was, you know, not just appearance, but personality. Really? You know, he said, you know, he was saying that of of his children that he knows so far, the ones he raised and then the the donor conceived children who he's met. He's like, you know, his raised daughter and me. He's like, you you two are the most like me, like more so more so than even like some of the children that he raised. Wow. Like, you know, even Genetics per personality wise. Genetics is a funky thing, man. Yeah. Genetics yeah. is funky. So we just kind of um, understand each other. Um, you know, there were emails where we kind of, I think, each read between the lines a little bit about each other. Ooh. And you could just kind of understand what what the other person was saying or thinking. Absolutely. And then meeting and actually talking, all those assumptions like were right, you know, wow. because we just kind of know how how the other person thinks. And it's 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 strange. It's it's very um 
creepy in a sense, and it's it's very powerful if you've never it, there's there's no experience like it. There's nothing nothing I can um, yeah specifically compare it to except like you know when you meet like a new person and you just click and you feel like you've known them for a lot longer but than you this have. Is, it's, it's like that different. on steroids. <laughs> I mean, every I, I've talked to so, so many donor conceived people about meeting their donors, meeting or finding a sibling, and then it's just, it's suddenly, um, I, I recently had uh, a David Barry on yes, the podcast, yes. and when he met his donor-conceived sister Morgan for the first time, Morgan said, your face is on my face! And I'm like, that's, it's a big yes. thing that, like, we all kind of feel. Yes. Um, and it's it's incredible. Now, when you were talking to your donor, did you talk about like what he was told by the doctor? A little bit, yeah. He um, he he was he really wanted to help. He okay. was actually not a, like a student at the time. He was already a practicing doctor, so okay. he was actually a little bit older. He was already thirty, thirty one. Oh, when, okay. When I was born, um, and I think he. We don't know exactly how long he donated. It was at least two and a half years. So he okay. was in his late twenties when he started. Um, Whoa! Yeah. Oh, so you could probably have a lot more siblings out there. Yeah. yeah. How many siblings do you know? So, so far, so far, there's four of us. So me and three. Oh, others. he was donated for two and a half years. Oh yeah. There's there's, there's, there's more, there's and they're more. all here in New York City yeah. area, Long and they, Island, and they have no idea that their donor can see. They probably. have no idea. They have no ah. idea. Oh, oh, look out! Look out for them. They're, I know. I uh, there's I have have had so much grief about that exact thing. Is if they're okay. Uh, yeah. Really, if if they're okay, because I know I wasn't okay for so much of my life, and I think Yo, um, yeah. that might be a commonality that some of my siblings might uh, share with me. And so, um, as we were talking about the uh, mental health aspect, which I inherited, thought I inherited from my dad, but there's also a component there on my biological father's mm -hmm. side. So, well, let, let's let's talk about that moment because that yeah. is a that's a hot moment mm -hmm. I know in your life. That I remember when you told me this story, I was I, my I, I was just frozen to my core over this story, um, and then I was like. Cassandra, can I please tell this on TikTok because people need to understand what I I apologize. I I don't you know no not to be disrespectful to to your recipient parents, but this was a a massive idiotic mistake on their part. Oh yeah, yeah. massive idiotic <laughs> mistake. Um, and we did make a a video on it, and mm -hmm. your your story did go viral. Yeah. Um, I so I would love for you to talk about. To the extent of which your recipient parents were hiding your donor conception from you and yes. the impact that it had on your literal health and safety and well-being. Yeah. So when I was, um, I really started having problems with depression at the age of 12. Okay. Um, That's so young. Very young. Very yeah. young. Very, and, and very severe depression. Like there was an attempt on, you know, to take my life. And um, oh my so, I mean, it was, it was nothing that would have worked, um, but, but it was, it was, it was a 12 year old uh, attempting. But still the fact that you better. were even going through that is yeah. massive. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so sorry. I know. Thank you. Um, so it, it, it was a tough period. I managed to um, hide it. Okay. For um, a while, for my parents, there was also eating disorders and 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 self injury and other um, other dis you know kind of um, issues, other yeah. other problems I was going through. Um, and when I was about fifteen, I kind of couldn't hide it anymore and kind of had a, a <laughs> felt like a midlife crisis where I just kind of couldn't get out of bed, couldn't go to school, couldn't function anymore. Um, and so um, my you know parents took me to a psychiatrist. Um, you know, diagnosed me as having depression and we're sitting in the, uh, you know, and it's one of those moments where you remember it so vividly and you don't really know why you remember it so vividly. Oh, I think we, we know why. <laughs> this was a pretty core memory because, for you. Yes, exactly. And then you realize that there's trauma in that memory and it might not even be the way you in, in, initially envisioned there being trauma in that memory. So the, the, the reason I originally thought was because the psychiatrist was asking my parents about their mental health history. So it's the psychiatrist, you and your parents are exactly. all sitting in a room. We're all okay. sitting in a room. Okay. And the psychiatrist, you know, first 
ask my mom and you know, my mom's a very anxious person, you know, but um, it's a lot of anxiety in her family. They're very anxious Italians, overprotective kind of thing. Um, but, you know, she's like, no, we were kind of anxious, but we, we, we all manage it. My grandfather had a little like obsessive compulsive disorder. But, you know, it, again, they all managed it you know, as they did back then. They as managed did, everything, which was you just don't feel it. <laughs> exactly. You just don't feel that was managing it. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, and then they went to my dad. And this was the first time I had heard um, the extent of my dad's uh, mental health history. Now, but at that point, he had already been institutionalized for a, a, a period oh, um, wow. when okay. I was 13. I don't know, okay. I, around that age um, for a, a couple months. And so I knew that there that there was an, uh, issues there. But it was the first time um, that I heard him speak about it to, to oh, the doctor. Wow. Um, so there was a very extensive history. My grandmother... Um, had had postpartum depression with my uh, my dad's younger brother, mm -hmm. um, and had been institutionalized. Had electric shock treatments mm -hmm. back in the fifty or fifties, early sixties, yeah. um, and that scared me. Um, the fact that that had been so severe, and then knowing that my dad had severe um, depression and anxiety, and what this, me diagnosing him years later, I think probably some form of kind of bipolar, um, but. Um, but yes, uh, he had extensive problems and, and, you know, had mentioned that it was it was um, genetic in his family, you know, that his mother had had those problems and genetic in his family. But he's talking about his daughter in which he's not genetically related to. Right. And I'm sure. And as we've underlined, you being donor conceived was never brought up. No, never, never. And so the doctor and and my dad then saying that he was on medication for his his depression and anxiety. Okay. And so the psychiatrist then goes on to ask my dad, well, what medications are you on? Because, you know, since you're her father, um, we might try those first. So my uh, my parents give him the, the the list of, you know, what medications have have worked or not worked for him. Um, and that was what my psychiatrist started with. So he didn't start with like first line things that you might normally start with a 15 year old. He started with the medications that my dad was on. And then um, once I had been on one of them for longer than, you know, like, you know, it's like takes a few weeks for it to see an effect or whatever. Still no effect. Still no effect. He's like, well, let, let's stay on it maybe like another month because, you know, if it worked for your dad, then maybe it'll work for you. And, okay, let's keep you on that one, but we'll add something else. But that worked for your dad, so we'll still keep you on that one. Um, and your parents are saying nothing. Nothing. Meanwhile, I'm a suicidal 15-year-old who's self-injuring and um, attempting. Uh, yeah, it was another, another uh, attempt. So, um, yeah. Oh my god! Yeah. So uh, oh my god. it took it took much longer to find the medication that worked because the one yeah. that, the one that worked ended up being one that um, you know he had not been on. Weird how but that worked. I, I was, uh, but I was try. You know, he my psychiatrist tried um, even um, more powerful medications. You know, kind of like. Uh, other things that had worked on my dad, other like stronger anti-anxiety drugs and stuff like that that had worked for my dad before switching an antidepressant to try another one other than the one that had worked for him. And just like all these, all this time. And I'm not saying that, you know, oh I, I know, I know um, it's a, it's a, a delicate science and there's a lot of trial and error there, but it, he, it, it, their, their lies oh my God. took my treatment in such a direction off of what would probably have been uh, the standard of what you would try for a 15 year old. Yeah. You know, first. And, and it would have been better to just say, I, you don't know the, the, my biological father's history. No, but the <laughs> fact that, uh, and honestly, it would have been better for him to go literally almost there, anything would have been better. Anything, <laughs> Anything would, would have been better than what they chose to do. Because anybody listening to this or watching this who understands mental illness, understands those kinds of medications, I, I mean, understands the weight of what you are saying. And yeah. it's the best um, analogy that I was ever told, uh, especially about the, those kinds of medications, is our understanding of how the brain works. Mental illness is still so 
new. Mm -hmm. And the medications right now, and like ideally what we need is we need medications that will come into your brain like a scalpel. But yeah. right now the medications, they're not that refined yet. It's still like taking a baseball bat. And this wasn't just a baseball bat. This was, we were pounding your head with 10 different baseball bats. Yeah. yeah. I can't. I even, you know, I even would have been, if, if, if when I confronted Why my mom about this. I have literally even excused you from the room. Exactly. Saying, like, honey, can we just have like a private moment with exactly. the dog? Exactly. Literally if they had to, anything. I, mean, I still would have been upset if they hadn't. If they you know, hadn't told me, but I would have felt at least better in terms of their valuing my health and safety yes. if they had told the doctor privately. But I, I asked my mom and she said no. And then it was like, well, he didn't say that he was, you know, he said that he wasn't sure what might work. So he was just going to try that. It was it was said it was all trial and error. I'm like, mommy. We clearly remember things very, you, very you differently. You guys actively lie. And then, I, you know, in college, I majored in psychology, and one of my areas of focus was psychopharmacology. So I'm like, Mommy, I specifically – I remembered all the medications because I was very into yeah. the, the medications, and I, I studied the, you know, about the biochemistry behind them and stuff oh like that God. in college. So – and I was, I was out of school. Uh, school for half of my sophomore year of high school from this because I was so sick that I was in bed and couldn't get up and um, so it it very much affected um, my my life. I <sighs> I'm speechless, which is a, a very uh, which is hard to get me to be. Um, all I can say is I'm so sorry. I am so sorry that you went through this. This was not fair. This was absolutely not needed. There is ten, there is 10,000 different ways this could have gone that would have been better. Yeah. And yeah. I am so sorry. Yeah. And I am so sorry for all the donor-conceived people who are listening who have gone through the same thing because exactly. we know you are not alone. Oh, I am not alone. So many times there was a heart condition. There was this, that. We hear all these stories. Oh my, People yeah. are lying in hospital beds and all this kind of stuff. And their, their parents children are still lying in hospital do, beds. Yes, exactly. Then they still do not tell the, the truth. People have had unnecessary, you know, surgeries, unnecessary oh my testing. I mean, you know, my yeah. my dad who raised me had uh, early onset rheumatoid arthritis. So every time, and I, you know, I have some chronic pain and stuff. So, I mean, I can't tell you every time I had, um, you know, pain uh, management issues, my twenties and thirties and stuff, I'd get my rheumatoid factor tested. Cause I'd be like, Oh, my dad has like the highest rheumatoid factor his oh doctor's ever seen. Guess what? I, I, and I have arthritis now, but it's osteoarthritis. It's still not rheumatoid arthritis. My rheumatoid factor is still really low. You know? It's so really low. And that's from my mom's side. Thanks mom. You know, so it's like, but it's, it's just like, I, I'm like, I'm like, you wasted insurance company money getting my rheumatoid factor tested all those times. I mean, if like, we're going to waste someone's money, you know what? <laughs> wait, waste their money. That's, but it's, it's, it's just like, it gets it's you wasted thinking. your emotion. I, I'm more upset that it, it wasted your, you know, emotional, your emotional spoons that you needed. Yeah. It's just, uh, it's just you wasted things. spoons on it. Okay. Yes. Yes. It's just all these things, you know, uh, and the, and the fact that it just it happens and the fact that it's still happening. Yeah. Parents are still, and even if they're trying to do the right thing now and they still don't have enough information about the donor's medical history because when I talked to my biological father yeah. and I asked him so did they take medical history history from you and he was a, a, an OBGYN so he you know knew what was happening and he was probably treating his own infertility patients mm -hmm. as well and he, he like laughed he's like they didn't ask me anything yeah. so they didn't take any health history no the only thing they tested for my mom said was um you know what is it gonorrhea or chlamydia. The, well, ST, the std test that was the only thing they did off the top and not hiv at the time. Oh, not HIV. My mom my mom specifically said that that um that was not until, you know, she was she had a miscarriage years later that that they mentioned at that point that they were testing for HIV, but okay. not not when I was uh conceived. Uh I know that uh, yeah. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> There's just there's so much to unpack. OK, so but let, let's go back. So you've brought up this moment in time with your with your parents, both of them or just your just mom? my mom, just my mom and her and and her excuses. Well, they were going to do trial and error anyway. Right. So exactly. there's been no form of accountability. So you've just uh, no. been gaslit. <laughs> yes. And it was it was. Well, but they said the doctors were healthy. They said they said they were healthy. They said they were healthy. I'm like. 
okay, well, I have firsthand information now from my biological father that they didn't even ask him anything about his health yeah. history. Um, I think we're, we're, but, <laughs> we're playing the, the ignorance card a little too hard here, Mom. Right, and I'm like, but that was 35 years ago anyway. Yeah. So even if he was super healthy at the time, which I'm sure he was a healthy young guy, you know, um, yeah. That, that would not apply. I mean, that was one of the first things I said to her. I was like, mommy, what about, you know, knowing that there's a much higher risk of like the BRCA gene mm -hmm. in Ashkenazi Jews and, and growing up in New Jersey, I had a lot of Jewish friends and um, knowing that, and I worked, I worked in healthcare before, um, before, before doing this donor conception stuff, before I had my daughter, I worked in, um, in healthcare. So I worked, yeah. I worked in um, elder care and hospice. So I saw people at the end of their lives. So I knew um, what, important health history had because I would talk to my clients a yeah. lot about, you know, their parents and how their parents aged and the, how they're aging currently and those kind of things. And they were, you know, drawing a lot of parallels and um, similar conditions. So I knew that, um, you know, cancer was often um, something that was more prominent in Ashkenazi families. So I, I literally well, said to my mom, because I was, I was breast, my, my daughter was a year and a half old at the time when I found oh out. My God. And so I, you know, I was still breastfeeding her and I, I you know, looked at my daughter and I was like, what the hell did I pass on to her? And I said to my mom, I'm like, mom, what about like my boobs? What about breast cancer? I literally said, mommy, what about my boobs? One I of, love that. One what my, about my boobs? One of my adoptee we, friends just loves, she's like, cause you to tell the boobs. Part. I'm like, yes. we do need that on a t shirt. <laughs> yes. What about my boobs? Yes. I want that on a shirt. Yes. And so I was like, what about breast cancer? Because I was 35 at the time. And I said, Mommy, I'm ethnically Ashkenazi. I'm 35. That's usually if you have a history of breast cancer, that's when they would start doing mammograms. I'm like, Mommy, what if this person who's my biological father has a bunch of sisters and they all died from breast cancer and they all have the BRCA gene? And she's just like, I don't know. They said he was healthy. And, you know, it was just that over and over again. And, you know, I'm very grateful. I do not have the BRCA gene. Um, you know, there's not a, a large history of cancer in my biological father's family. So um, but I, you know, being active in the Jewish community and in the the new new Jews, as we say, in some ways, um, I can say that not everybody is that lucky. And I know yeah. several people who have had preventative mastectomies um, because they did carry the BRCA gene from their uh, biological father, uh, whether it was a donor situation or an affair or whatever the situation was. As uh, since you and I were both um, late to discovering that we are half Ashkenazi Jewish, e yes. each of us are. Yes. Um, whenever I've mentioned that to anybody who grew up knowing that they were Ashkenazi mm -hmm. and they, I, I, all of them look at me and they're like, you didn't know you were Ashkenazi. Mm -hmm. You weren't told. I'm like, no, I was told my donor was going to be Scottish and Irish like my father. And they were like, and every single one of them is like the fact that you weren't told you didn't know is absolutely unethical due to how many genetic illnesses are passed exactly. in our ethnicity. They're like, that puts you in such fucking danger. I know. I'm, I, I was like, I yeah. am grateful I didn't marry someone who was Jewish because uh, you just don't know. You just don't know. You know, there's there, there's genetic screening required. I if, may for have had a crush on a few Ashkenazi mm -hmm. uh, uh, gentlemen in my lifetime, and now I'm so grateful that they rejected me. <laughs> And because you wouldn't have known to do the genetic they, screening. I mean, you know? maybe the reason I had this massive crush on them was because they were actually a half sibling, and I was like, I feel a connection. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but no, I mar I I did. I'm sort of like the opposite of you. I married my my nice Italian boy with the Yay. last name of Colombo. Yay! Yeah, his family from Sicily and Malta. <gasps> Beautiful. Yes, oh, we, that's we hope lovely. to hope to get to Sicily and Malta the next uh, Italian trip. Awesome. That's amazing. But yeah, no, it, it definitely, it, it's definitely made me real. Cause I, I grew up in New York my whole life. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've been to more bar and bat mitzvahs than I've been to sweet 16s. Um, and realizing like how easy it could have been for me to marry a sibling. Mm -hmm. yeah. How easy it could have been. Yeah. Easy it could have been, or even just a cousin. Yeah. And Absolutely. would have never have known. And it also makes me worried about like my donor with his raised children. They don't know. I'm willing yeah. to bet they have no idea yeah. that they should also be be looking out, that they should be. Exactly. They need to be on DNA testing sites as well. Yeah. The donors oh, they should raise be. children. They need Absolutely. to be. Yeah. Oh, my God. So what is your. So how have things now 
How are things now with your mom and your dad? How How is that relationship? Ugh, well, you know. That didn't start off good. <laughs> no, no. Um, you know, it's it's very sad. There there was not a lot of accountability taken. There were a lot of other family factors um, going on at the time. And um, my mom, who is, uh, you know, was my my really my my best friend she's a wonderful mother i won't criticize um her she was born to be a mother really wonderful uh person but this experience really warped her yeah. um and that's understandable and my dad who has uh, again i i love him very much and you know he has a very good good side to him but but does have some more narcissistic qualities and along with just having a lot of a lot of mental health struggles yeah um so my mom kind of gave me like a year where she was kind of like supportive of me and then and then that <laughs> was not done. not like officially it wasn't like but it was like basically once kind of a year rolled by and i was actually doing kind of worse because you know the roller coaster of it all the roller coaster of the grief it sneaks, right. It does sneak up on you. And I was in a really bad place. Um, you know, I I actually was hospitalized in recalling that scene from the psychiatrist's office yeah. to a therapist. I actually um, because I had very severe PTSD, CPTSD from this. And so in, oh my it, God, in, big, <laughs> and not from the same situation, but I also I was diagnosed with CPTSD. Uh, yes. yes, it's amazing. This is fantastic. Yeah, it's the best diagnosis ever. No, so I, I was I was in a in a therapist's office. Actually, it wasn't my therapist. It was in uh, like a hospital setting, actually, like an outpatient hospital setting, because I was in and out of those for a couple of years um, regarding the situation. Um, and I was recalling that incident and I completely dissociated. I couldn't walk. I couldn't talk like I was like I couldn't form words. Mm -hmm. And I actually got rushed to the hospital and oh it was just God. it was it was a mess. So. Um, so that was and that was about about a year in. Mm -hmm. um, I was still in that state of, of I would I would go paralyzed like from the waist down um, where I couldn't walk and things like that when I was having like flashbacks and stuff. Um, and so I was yeah. in a really bad place. And at that point, my mom had basically was like, OK, like your time to uh, <laughs> stop talking about this is, is up. I mean, she didn't say that. But the last thing, you know, the last thing she said to me in person was, you know, I always knew there was something wrong with you. You cried a lot as a baby. And I'm like, oh. Okay. Anyway, so that was, you know, and oh, I, th that, I thanks, think. Thanks, mom. Yeah, I think. Yeah, mom, babies. Yeah, babies cry. Babies right. cry. Mom, sorry. Babe. Sorry. I, I know that for a fact. I'll work on that <laughs> next time. Yeah. Yeah. In my next life, I'll try not to cry as much as a baby. So like, you know, and I, I know that my dad got to her because I, you know, I only had one conversation with my dad about this and, and primarily to reassure him that I was that he was still my dad in every way and I loved him and he was my dad and because, all of that. Because we have to do that in order to... Because that is on the... Because that is just the donor-conceived life mm -hmm. is we have to worry about everybody else's emotions exactly. um, and fuck us exactly. because why would we have any negative emotions about this? Because right. we're here and aren't we just so grateful to be alive? Exactly. So yeah. he, he went yeah. the, the main mm -hmm. the main message he gave me during I that. really hope that everyone heard the um the the sarcasm in my voice in that. I really do. I did. I did. Okay, I, I can tell I can tell from here. You can tell right here. <laughs> I'm just real yeah. Well, because you, you you saw the deadpan face of just me going like I fucking hate it here. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, so he his his main statement to me during that meeting, um, and we did have a couple moments of of sort of understanding, but his main thing was it wasn't a lie because you weren't supposed to find out. It wasn't a lie because you weren't supposed to find out. Okay, that's actually very funny. I know. Uh, that actually is. Well, that's, that's I, really I actually, I was actually able to kind of move past that pretty quickly because even my mom thought that that was pretty ridiculous at the time. But that's the point, the point funny. being that my dad got to her after a while okay. and, and kind of influenced her into thinking like, why isn't she over this yet? Um, and so um, there were some very, very hurtful um, things done by my family kind of as a as a unit uh, kind of ganging up on me to. Um, Again, that's <laughs> so common yeah. with donor conceived people. Yeah. Once we find yeah. out and we don't exactly react the way that they want us to. Mm -hmm. There's a retaliation. Exactly. Exactly. And that's so common with donor conceived people. I wish and I you know, I feel like I've I've known for almost going on six years the end of this year. And at the time that this was happening to me, I I, I was so sad and I felt so unlovable and so just worthless as a human being. 
And now I realize when I'm going to webinars and hearing psychologists speak about this and talking to other people, this is what happens. Yeah. No, this happens to, I'm going to say everybody, but this is how families react to this. This was not unique to my situation, even though the specific circumstances. Also, not you know, unique but, to just donor conceived people, adoptees. Oh, no. Also. Yes. NPEs, yes. anybody finding out that a parent is not a parent and then, this you know, breaking the secret so, open. Yeah. Yeah. So, so when I look at my family now and think about, you know, how they reacted I you know they can say what they want about about my reaction or how I didn't heal enough or I didn't do enough or whatever but um, um. really really I was I was fighting uh, for my life and fighting to parent my child um, to keep myself alive for her sake um, yep. and to make make her early few years um, happy ones mm -hmm. despite what I was going through and that was really my main focus at the time um, was 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 uh, survival and um, they didn't understand that and so I, I haven't had um, contact you know my daughter does does have a relationship with my mom um, thanks to my husband uh, but um, but yeah I have not quite been able to uh, get to the point you know the the, uh, the apologies that were given were just very like I'm sorry you feel that way kind uh, of very thing. much yeah, yeah. Like, and, and I'm proud of you it's like uh, oh thank you uh, th thank you thank you thank you very much thank you very <laughs> How long have you been essentially no contact? Uh, about four years. Oh my god! Yeah. So it's I'm, it's hard. Yeah. But you know, it's also funny because they're talking about the Jewish thing too. And one of the first things my mom, you know, mentioned to me, really, uh, as she's crying after she disclosed to me, you know, right before the uh, the question about the boobs was, I always thought you were Jewish, and I'm like, you know, okay, one of those very very bizarre memories where you're like, what is that even supposed to mean? That, that feels a little uh, red flaggy. Yeah, and I know my family's not like that, so it's it's just bizarre. To, it, yeah. It's, because, again, like in 1982, when I was conceived and born, they had absolutely no information. Again, they were just told it was going to be somebody who maybe looked like my dad or something, but it turned out to be somebody of a completely different ethnic background, so they, they just guessed. You know, my mom just looked at me for 35 years and like, guests and I'm just like as a new parent myself at the time I'm like how could you look at your child like that like trying to pick apart what ethnic group they are and it was just very strange and and I can you know look back and and see how um you know maybe things that maybe she she picked up on or questions I asked about uh mm -hmm. you know <laughs> religion or <laughs> but, but who knows well but speaking of religion you were raised catholic I was, yes, yes. My dad was technically Protestant, not really practicing, although he had some Catholics in his family too. And my mom's family was nominally ca Italian Catholic, you know. So I went to Catholic school and I was, I was, yeah, I was, drama. I was the, you know, I was, I was the, as I said, I was a very good, good kid. I never misbehaved in class. Anybody watching that from elementary school, hello, you can v vouch for the fact that I never got in trouble. I want pulls ever. from. From former Cassandra Adams co-students. Yes. Was she the goody two-shoes that she she proclaims? Abs I never did anything wrong. However, I rebelled against the uh, Catholicism aspect of school. I would refuse to go up for communion. Wow. Um, I would, you know, argue with my mom when I got home about why did I have to take religion? I didn't want to. I didn't believe this. I remember we were doing like. So your yeah. ancestors were calling to you. Oh, yeah. Going, no, no, no. You're one of us. Yeah. You're one of I us, kids. I just kid. felt in, in church services, How? I felt like. You know, like pain, like pained, you know, wow. like there was something just traumatic something about being there and being told about Jesus and all of this. And Yo, I just that didn't, didn't kick in for me till high school. Yeah, that's when like I remember there was that that was because I was super Catholic, like anybody like I was the kid arguing about how right Catholicism is. That's and I know that sounds so weird coming from me now, but no, I was the one who's going like no, but Jesus is the way. Like what are you talking? Like I was that really cringy kid. 
but then there was like this total flip in high school. I remember I was sitting in church and they like I was an altar server, dude. And I uh, and I remember sitting in church and they kept going like be a good person so you'll be rewarded in the kingdom of heaven. Be a good person so you'll be rewarded. Be, and I remember going like why is it this reward mm-hmm. system? Why that yes. doesn't make sense? Like why can't they just teach you to be a good person to be a good person? And that's when I think my ancestors were just like, "And you've had enough time in church. Exactly. You're one of us." Exactly. That's right. They, and she's, yeah. She, Laura, go sit with your cousins. We have food. Go over there. You've it's had your so time with true. her. You're done. Exactly. It's so, so true. It and I've never looked way. back, and it was this immediate cutoff. And yeah. I remember it was this massive switch. Yeah. And it was this break from that organized religion of, of Catholicism that I was just like, I, I don't vibe with this. I, this is, I don't vibe with this. The main person I liked was the Virgin Mary because when I was a kid, I used to put, well, being being Catholic. I actually, honestly, my family didn't give two hoots about Jesus anyway. It was all about the Virgin Mary. That's what Italians were. It was like the Virgin Mary was everywhere. So like I would go with like a towel on my head and I'd be like, look, I'm the Virgin Mary. But that was like, you know, like really little, like, you know, six, seven mm-hmm. and stuff. But now I'm re- now I'm realizing I was I was a Jewish woman. You were. You I was were, just a Jewish woman. You were you, you you were playing Mary. You were you were yes. Yenta and Fiddler. Exactly. I I will say no. I do get I do get the Mer- Mary thing because I so I went to um uh, I went to Resurrection uh, which is in Rye, New York, and they had this like really great Christmas pageant every mm-hmm. Christmas. And I, of course, being the little fucking theater kid that I always was, was like I want to do it. And instantly, like when I was like that little four year old like lamb. In the, you know, I just was like, I want to play Mary. And I had my fucking eye on that. I was like, I'm going to be the star. I'm going to be Mary. And I was stuck as an archangel for like four years. I was an archangel. And I was like, but then I got that chance. I got to be Mary, the star. I, and and I remember the, the apparently the pageant director, like um, she was like, Laura was definitely the best Mary we've ever had. So, I mean, yo, I've been on TV. I've been on SAG. Uh-uh, nothing compares to that Mary moment where I'm holding up my American Girl doll b- bitty baby going like, yes, I am here. I have made it. Thank you. So, no, I totally get the Mary thing. <laughs> and it still is. Like, I remember that adrenaline rush. <laughs> it's so funny. It That's is. It's so funny. That that will be, that that will probably be my favorite Catholic moment I've ever had is my, my Mary <laughs> moment. That was, and then I retired from Christmas pageant on a high because I was just like, yeah, I know. You had achieved it. I had achieved it. I, I can now retire in infamy. Me, me and the bitty baby will just be, you know, sipping... You know, our our cranberry juice in the corner now. Thank you so much. No autographs, please. <laughs> the bitty baby, baby savior of the world. The bitty baby. Yeah, I think that's what they were called. Bit, like, it was because American Girl dolls, like, made their own, like, baby dolls as well. And I think it was called Bitty Baby. So, someone please correct me. I was very, I, I was, I lived in Westchester. We were all the American Girl doll. Like, that was, that was what it is. Yeah. I still have my American Girl dolls. They're, they're ready. So cool. They're ready. Ah, no. Okay. Anyway, that yeah. was, okay. So, you... But you have completely like converged into you have to Judaism, which yes. I love. Yes. I love that you have taken this on. I just I started immediately. I for all my fellow Jewish people watching, I found out between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, which is the holiest uh, ten days in the Jewish calendar, and so which is the which is the New Year for Rosh Hashanah. Uh, I was conceived on Rosh Hashanah. Beautiful. I was conceived I... on Valentine's Day. Nice. <laughs> Romantic. Um, my uh, yeah, because that was my 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 parents' clinic was closed because it was Rosh Hashanah. Oh my gosh. Um, and <sighs> so they had to find another donor who would be willing to donate fresh on that oh day. My. And just to, you know, my 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 donor is an Orthodox Rabbi Moyle. He's also an OBGYN as well. But oh so gosh. I mean, it was like we were the stars of David were converging yeah. for me. Yeah, it's incredible. But yeah, I. I dove in immediately and I was like, I have to figure out what this what this means for me yeah. um, and went through so much grief at being uh, losing a lifetime of connection to the culture. And, yeah. um, you know, despite being like, I don't want to I don't want to delve into into religion again. But um, upon, you know, studying more about Judaism and finding my place in it and you can be an atheist Jew, you can be an agnostic Jew. And it really fit um, fit my um, views about the world and about life. Um and about, you know, 
spirituality in, in whatever sense I, I felt it. So I, I, I ended up pursuing a formal conversion because, amazing. you know, you have to, if it's your father's side, you got to do the conversion, especially since, you know, we hadn't been raised it. So, so I converted, saw him official and. Mazel. Thank you. Thank you. No, if I. So yeah, I, I, yeah. I'm a practicing, practicing Jew. And and I'm very proud of it. I'm, I'm, and it brings you happiness. It it really does. That's um, wonderful. It's brought me a lot of connection to to my ancestors. It's just a big part of of what I felt disconnected. You know, there's the disconnect from your immediate the immediate family, yeah. like the you know your your biological father or siblings, and um, but then there's the the cultural disconnect for a lot of us too from whatever culture we find out that we are especially yeah. when it's something where people uh, pegged you as that or you're noticeably um of that you know racial or ethnic background where people have commented on that so it's yeah it's, they yeah. Yeah. yeah oh yeah yeah so it's it's been it's been very validating to see parts of myself um that show up in in my study or practice of Judaism, it's it, it it I find more parts of myself in in that, um, just knowing yeah. where where I come from and where what my ancestors lived through for me to to be here. So yeah, I mean, and you and I have talked uh, a lot about you know Judaism, and I'm still you know taking baby steps into like you know starting to explore more of that for myself. Um, and it because it is it is this. It is there and it's yeah. and it is something that you do feel. Absolutely. You you do feel it and yeah. it, it it is and especially because um I mean obviously, you know, you can be because Judaism is a ethno ethno religion. It is an ethno yeah. religion, so there is there is a lot of nuance, there is a lot of complications. Yes. But for us who are Ashkenazi, yeah. um, and who both of us, you and I both very much look Ashkenazi. Yes. Yeah. Um it is always part of our identity exactly it is always part of our identity yeah um and yeah oh my god a lot of inherited um you know intergenerational trauma too that passes on in in dna that they're doing that research now and you know generations of persecution and yeah you know the holocaust and stuff a lot of us when we find out you know because i i that's one of the things I do is is help people who have that particular discovery and have groups for that. So it's, you know, a lot of people start delving into the research on their on their new family. And, you know, you see all the deaths in the 1940s in your family tree. And it's yep. very difficult to grasp that um, that as an adult, it's very difficult to uh, grasp the idea that you um, would have been one of those people because yeah. you, your, you yourself, your just your body as you exist would have been a target. Yeah. Um, and it's very hard to conceptualize that unless it's it's you, unless it's yourself. And that goes for that goes for so many uh, um, minority groups. And it's it's you know it's definitely um, such an important lesson about the ability of 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 humans to empathize with one another, that we can go so far in our empathy and understanding, but then it, it, it really need to um, believe people because there's only so much you can know mm -hmm. without living it yourself. But the, I'm going to say the um, racial identity, the ethnic identity is something that a lot of, uh, uh, I'm trying to figure out the best way to, to, to phrase this, and I, I bet you'll know exactly how to do it, but that kind of confusion is something that really hits donor conceived people because you'll grow up thinking I am this. Yes. And that will be a huge part of your identity yeah. and then it's ripped away from you and yeah. then you find out fully that you are something else. Yep. Exactly. And that has hit people with both race and ethnicity. Yeah. People will think that they are one race their entire life and realize that they're not. Yeah. Or uh, an ethnicity and realize that they're not and we see that all the time with donor conceived people. Yeah. And it's awful because either what their parents lied to them, the clinic lied, the donor lied, right? Um, and it's horrific. Yeah, yeah. Or the donor doesn't know themselves because maybe the donor is adopted or donor conceived and doesn't know. And, oh my god! You know, there's yeah. all kinds of situations like that, and um, people have have a right to to know what their background. You know, but I'd love to. 
you are, as I said, somebody who the donor conceived community kind of meets first. You're sort of that first face that a lot of us meet, uh, including myself. I think you were oh. one of the first people that when I did enter officially the community, <laughs> yeah. even though I, you know, knew I was donor conceived at 14, I still was very, I think, late to finding out like, oh shit, there's a community of us? No fucking way. Yeah. All right, <laughs> rock on. Um, what has been your experience? What are patterns that you see that you find when people find out they're donor conceived and find the community? What What are similar conversations and patterns that you see a lot? <sighs> I think there's sometimes um, a, a, um, a rush to figure things out all right away. Okay. I need to figure out who this person is. Mm -hmm. I need to figure out, um, you know, what clinic, like even before being able to get the information, so many people come in and are, are determined to, I need my clinic and I need the donor number. And especially if they're our age and there is no donor number and mm -hmm. you have to kind of break that to them mm -hmm. or break to them, even if they do have a donor number that it may be from a clinic that is closed. And I don't think yeah. pe because people don't readily know about this no. world when oh, they come in. This is so niche. Yeah, yeah. And it's comically awful. Yes. Like there is, I, I always have such a hard time, ex like when I have to start like from square one explaining it, people look at me like I have five heads because they're yeah. like, Laura, this is the, the fertility industry, not the Legion of Doom. Like, come on. <laughs> What are you doing? And I'm like, no, 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 but it really is this not. I promise. Really I'm, I know. I'm, I'm not making this up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think people have that, and it's always it always feels sad to me yeah. because I'm like, oh, you have to like tell them that it might be more difficult. And but you do also have <laughs> yeah. to you do also have to give them the hope though that because especially if they found out through DNA testing that more than likely they will at some point, even if they haven't yet, be matched with somebody who can lead them to. Yeah. to their biological parent. It could take, um, you know, years. Yes, exactly. I mean, I have a feeling for us in our age group because so many of our siblings don't know they're donor conceived. Yeah. I have a feeling we're going to find our siblings when their children get yes. a DNA and test. people are already starting. Yep. I think that's that that's starting. when you and I are going to find the majority of our siblings. Exactly. Um and it's it's so it, it affects multiple generations. It affects kids. I mean that's that's always sad too when new people come in and they talk about their kids having yeah. um a genetic condition and then the you know mm -hmm. not it not being in any yeah. people in their family and stuff. Um that's another thing I see when I when when people come in is concern for for health health oh, history. Yeah. Um, people come in and just especially, feel like they don't know who they are. Especially if they've been suffering from chronic illness their whole life and they yep. then they just go like, wait a minute, what the fuck? Yeah. Oh, yes. it was this this whole time? Yep. Oh yep. my God. Mm -hmm. Yep. There's so many cases like that and then they find the, the, the family, um, their biological family and it's like, oh, yep, that was, that was something that they dealt with too. Mm -hmm. um, that's another thing that people just, people just are, are, are in, just, they're just in shock and they're yeah. sad. Yeah. They're just so sad and they don't know how long it's going to take to to feel better. And it could they take a while. don't know how they can, you know, trust their parents and they're trying to be understanding of their yes. parents still and some of them have not yeah. con confront see so so many you know, of them haven't confronted Yes, the, the I know. Oh, um, the amount of donor conceived people who face um I would say two things in particular. How do I tell my parents that I know I'm donor conceived? Mm -hmm. How do I break the news to them that yes. I know that I know this now? Yep. And two, how do I tell my sibling? Yep. Because yep. I found out and I know they're donor conceived as well. Yep. How do I tell them exactly. that they're how, how do I get the and those are the two two of the most common conversations I would say that we have all the time. I would say right underneath that is I just got matched with a sibling. I just got matched with a donor. How on earth do I contact mm -hmm. this? How do a, I reach out? How do I reach out in a in a positive way that's not like terrifying? Yeah. yeah. I would say that those are those are very common conversations that we have continually. Yeah, because now, you know, now that DNA testing has become more popular, a lot of the sibling groups yeah. have at least one person on there so that anybody te who's testing now will match with a half sibling 
and will yeah. get the, can get the story of their conception yeah. from their newfound half siblings before they talk to their parents. Because even like yeah. I said, with myself, like six years ago, like, I, yeah, I did have one half sibling. But if I tested now, there would be more on there. And then I would really start to question. But at the time with just one, yep. um, I confronted my mom first before trying to figure out the situation. Um, so a lot of people now are being told by the siblings that they match with. Yeah, that's a that's a fun time. Um, yeah. that that one that one's a fun one. Um, that it's it's the sibling that breaks the news, and there is so like if I got a message from a half sibling, yeah. and they're like, "How are we half siblings? How would this hap- happen? How would you advise me to message that person back and let them know?" Uh, well, um, a lot of times it's you know I I know how we're related. Um, would you like to talk to your parents about it? first and Mm -hmm. you know you can you can do it that way you can ask them to go to their parents and question them first um or you can just say i i do know how we're related would you like me to tell you and then you know you could give them your phone number or your email um if you want to you know whichever way they would they would like to to be told or a zoom link or whatever you know um but do be aware that you might be the one telling them that they're donor yes, conceived. That, yes. that so you do need there is a delicacy there is a delicateness exactly. and empathy of like of I, I do agree with the encouraging to talk to your parents first. Yeah. And what I've always told donor conceived people is like I am a big proponent. I truly believe go take your get, go get your DNA tested. If you think there's yes. a chance that you're donor mm-hmm. conceived, my God, take the fucking test. Yes. But take it with the understanding that once you take it, you cannot unfind this knowledge. Exactly. And exactly. do have that emo- be ready. I literally just had another follower just find out that they're donor conceived. And I'm just like, oh my God, pumpkin. Okay. And I'm like, like, okay, here's the groups. Here's where you're going to go here. And I'm like, how are you doing there? I know. It's like, it's, it's, you know, there's, there's a welcome. There's a formula now. We need a welcome package that we just send send out. Yes. And that's the way it is now. And even in the last five years, things have changed so much in that way. And I'm, that's the main thing I want to get across to people who are finding out now is like, you are not alone because I think so many of us felt like we were alone. It's, it's donor, being donor conceived is very isolating. Yes. Which is why I do really I'm a big um, proponent with telling everybody connect with the community yes connect with the community you have to do that because one we're there's like we have different online chat forums but once you because what you're going to do is you're going to start reading people posting their story and you're going to go holy shit that's my story yeah uh, that yep. literally just happened mm-hmm. where somebody posted their story and in the comments one of our friends was like this literally could have been me yeah. this literally was my story yep it's you the amount of validation you will get and and I can't like th- those weird feelings in the back of your head that you don't allow yourself to feel. Yes. You're going to see those expressed in these groups and go, oh, shit, it is OK for me to feel these it things. It is. Whatever you're feeling is completely valid and yes. normal. Mm-hmm. Like it's OK to not be OK with this information. And it's 100%. OK to feel like you can't touch it yet it's too overwhelming oh, if you need you know? to put this in the drawer for a bit of time that's okay i the only thing that i would always encourage donor can see people to do is just check the medical shit yep. just get the medical oh, shit yes. because that does affect you yep. that does affect you, your kids that is the mm-hmm. one thing that i'm like i respect the fact if you're like i don't want to i don't want to reach out to the donor yeah. i don't want to reach out to siblings i really don't want to be active in the community i'm like that is Okay, this is yeah. your journey, yeah. but just check the medical shit because that does affect your quality of life. Yeah. And I want you to be healthy and healthy and, and thriving. Exactly, that'd be my only. Exactly, I'm like, just don't don't completely ignore it to that point because yeah. then it just gets to the like denial area. And then where that that's, adds, that and that 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 adds psychological burden too. It ain't healthy you know? for you as, no, as well. No, you. It's yeah. more secret keeping, more shame involved. So. I mean, I've been an advocate of talking talking about it, you know, publicly at this point. I mean, not that you're everybody has to be ready to do it on any no, kind of timetable, but yo, no you know. one has to, not everyone has to be us. No. <laughs> no one has to be No one has to wear the donors not anonymous shirt. Oh, and I brought Hashtag ab- abolish anonymity. Yeah, I brought my friends too. What did you bring? I brought my oh friends. My God! So not everybody has to go out and buy like plush sperm and eggs. Plush like, you sperm don't, and eggs. You don't need to do that in order to um, be 
a good donor conceived person. No, you you don't. You don't have to do that in the least. This doesn't, unlike, okay, because like with us, this has now become like our entire identity. You don't yeah. have to be yeah. us. It's my job at this point. Really. Yes. <laughs> But let, let let us talk more about your your job because you yeah. do you are an active advocate and you are talking in the to the industry. Like you are in some big ass fucking rooms. You are talking to clinics, cryobanks, ASRM. Uh, ASRM yeah. is the American Society of Reproductive Medicine. They are the ones who basically constitute the guidelines for the clinics and cryobanks to follow when it comes to donor conception. Now, let me underline guidelines, not regulations. Right. Guidelines. Right. So it's it's basically like fucking confetti. Like it's like it's meaningless. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It means nothing. Yeah. Um. So. What has your experience been like working with the industry and talking? Like, how is so? It's been the good and the bad and the ugly. Yeah, it's been really interesting working um, with the ASRM. I'm on the task force for the uh, for the needs are for uh, donor conceived people and their families. Um, and this task force was created December 2022. Yes, yes. So it's a year. It's a year commitment. I think, like technically, it was like an October to October. I wonder why I was not asked to be on it. <laughs> We're lucky. We have we have three donor conceived people on it, um, which is which is really good. And I, I have it could to be say, better. Oh, it could be better. I but okay. I know. I know. Oh, all right. Yes. Yes. We might get another donor conceived person. Hopefully oh, that'd be great. You know. So it's 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 a you know it's. It's are they? Good. May I ask? Are the advocates all sperm donor conceived, or do you have egg donor conceived as well? Um, everybody is sperm. Mm. That's on there, right? Okay, now. yeah, we, yes. we need to see some diversity yes. within our donor the conception. Good, the good part is is that we are reaching out. So if I have reached out to you, or will reach out to you, um, to to come and speak with the ASRM, good. that is something that we are doing, knowing that we are a task force of I think like sixteen ish people. Um, and that we need to listen to all the voices involved yeah. in, in this industry. And and because the people on the task force are from different areas of mm -hmm. the fertility industry, we have, you know, some people who are psychologists, mm -hmm. um, some medical providers, uh, some lawyers, a genetic counselor. Okay. So people in various areas of the of the industry and of course donor can see people themselves and people who have been various um, uh, involved themselves personally. In some way, in addition to being, you know, a medical provider or, or and so um, everybody has some knowledge about donor conception, but not everybody has the same knowledge in every okay. area. So that's kind of where that's we're trying to good. fill in, fill in gaps okay. for everybody. But everybody. Are there any yeah. recipient parents in that group? I don't think anybody is. Oh, um, okay. Someone is an embryo donor, I okay. believe. So, um, but it's, you know, open situation and stuff where there's understanding of what what actually happens. It's not a glossed over like, hey, everything's a gift and it's all pretty and rainbows. So it's it's nice to be able to um, speak with other people who know from experience that there need to be changes. Everybody in the task force is aware that change needs to happen. Everybody's on that page, which is okay. really wonderful to have people who are leaders in the ASRM on that page of stuff needs to needs to happen here are uh, okay so then i would ask so are are there pe so there are people within the task force who are going who are looking at the data the situation and going like oh shit there's some problems here yeah there are definitely okay. definitely so that's that's you know and that's probably if i say any more i might have to kill you oh, <laughs> I no, don't I like that. I'm in a basement for this. Just, but no, um, but it's 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 but it, it's been it's been refreshing in that way. I appreciate you know? hearing that. Let's keep yes. that energy moving. I mean, I, I tend to be a positive. You know, I I again, as you said, I well, get along. I, you, I you tend get to get along. I yeah. really, I really always generally tend to think people have the best of intentions, unless they seriously, seriously prove prove otherwise to me. Of course. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm putting a lot of trust and I don't know how far we're going to get in this one year. Um, but I do know that, you know, there's there's a bigger goal of making sure that the information that we're collecting um, is going to be disseminated to disseminate <laughs> <laughs> um, to ASRM providers all through every area of the fertility industry that they're hoping that, you know, the, the, the knowledge that yeah. we're talking about, you know, the, the, the need to know facts about what donor conception is really like 
will be something that we can pass on to all ASRM of course. providers of any sort. So that psychologists who are treating recipient parents are, and donors are on the same are all on the same Good. page with disclosure and um, you know that doctors are giving patients proper advice about this because they're not always the ones who are counseling about things like disclosure, for instance. But yeah. that they're on the same page so that they know, and if that comes up in their in their medical relationship, that that's something that you know the doctor fertility doctors are are aware of and know some of the issues regarding. Now, I know you, you can only share with me limited information about the task force, and I, I, I want to be respectful to that. So sort of taking that task force, and we're just going to put it over there. We're not going to talk <laughs> about that. Um, what has been – what have you found as challenging – because – sorry, let me rephrase. I'm constantly asked all the time, how the hell is the industry like this? How is how, – how are they this – arrogant this ambivalent negligent how are they it's how is it this horrible how is it and it's still this bad how what have been when you have talked to different members of the industry in general whether that is asrm or somebody who works at a clinic or a cryobank like all of the above what have been the challenges that you've seen as to like why the industry is like wh- why why we can't move forward what is the thought process behind those people yeah you know i think i mean i think like with adoption it 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 does start with the origins of the practice to an extent you know adoption in georgia tan and you know um basically kidnapping children and selling yeah. children trafficking and stuff and then with donor conception the secrecy involved and in, you know in uh I mean so, the first donor conception yeah, was sexual assault it really was and yeah. and and the secrecy involved um and really the eugenic aspect that was popular in the early to mid 20th century um you know which seeped its way into the donor conception world would you um, mind um uh talking a little bit more about that yeah um so you know i mean Donor insemination or just, you know, insemination, you know, a lot of beginnings with animal husbandry and breeding animals. And um, so when we're talking about breeding humans in that way um, and gets a bit uh, icky. And and as we know, in as we're talking about in, you know, in Nazi Germany and there was a big push for um, master race kind of uh, instances. And that wasn't isolated to Nazi Germany, that mindset in, in that period of uh, no eugenics has found its way into many many different and so in in the uh you know pre and you know donor donor insemination really peaked not peaked but really uh the numbers went up after after world war ii and so it was a lot of um you know the most desirable the smartest the most handsome uh medical students combined with the fact that the recipient mothers also had to be of a high intelligence of a certain uh, socioeconomic class, probably of a certain ethnic background and stuff. So this was, you know, this was the the mentality. And of course, it was all a secret. Yeah. So, you know, this oh, is yeah. after well, World War Two. This yeah. is the mindset. And it, it, it's it's really the intention of breeding smarter children, healthy children, better looking children. You know, that was that was a thought in in doctors minds in in those days. And I feel like it almost does. You know, it hasn't gone completely away. And oh, no, you'll see that in, you know, the amounts they pay certain donors based on their backgrounds and things well, like that. I, and, I challenge everybody go into an active donor profile because you can see they will list all the active donors. Go look into it. Go, go, go check out the major cryobanks. And see what ethnicity, what race, what religion is the most popular. See what see what's available because I've actively started doing this, and you can definitely tell that there is a um, certain that the the ratio is not even. Yeah. It's quite tilted in a right. certain way that you, we can we can guess. Yeah, yep. there's the the oh, yeah. there was the uh, Nobel Prize sperm bank, which was was literally a you, you know eugenics experiment where they were purposely trying to get Nobel Prize winners to um, 
you know, donate to the the best quality women. How and, much were those vials? I don't know, right? So it's it's you know it's got that history. So I think the history of secrecy, the history of this kind of icky history, um, has still impacted, and this the, the secrecy truly and just in general we know you know infertility has yeah. has a big stigma um which it still needs, does it still it still, still does. does and so those i think aspects are why the industry has developed with such a veil of secrecy around it yeah. and then of course you know when you get into america and you get into the capitalism and the business side of it then that's i feel like how that's, do we commodify these kids exactly i feel like that yeah. becomes a huge part of how the industry got to where it is today and then, I mean, the, the other thing is the very American mindset of, you know, I want what I want and I want, you know, and um, I will not compromise. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, I'm, I'm a parent after infertility. I know I know uh, what it's like and stuff. But and it, so there's nothing wrong with continuing to try and, and hoping that doctors can give you answers and all these things. Um, but, you know, I notice you know, you notice that there's a, a big mindset of, of, of I want what I want and <laughs> and I will get it. And so clinics are, are meeting that that demand. Um, well, it's taking you know? advantage because it is that very capitalistic. I want what I want met with infertility trauma exactly exactly and so and I together think that's that is it, a very powerful toxic concoction it's extremely powerful and i think that's kind of how how we got to to where we are now how yeah. we got to the secrecy and how we get to the whole um you know when we look at the adoptee rights movement you know they've been they've been adamant about telling from the beginning for much longer than than we have we oh. still we still talk to recipient parents where their doctors have told them not to disclose. Oh yeah, you know, and now in 2023, and it's I not mean, common practice right. anymore. But there are still mm -hmm. doctors who do actively tell recipient parents, "You don't need to tell them that they're donor conceived." Yeah, no, but we we really, but like, thank God, you know, the donor conceived community has, you know, really found the adoptee community, yes. and we have oh. like broken bread. That has been one of my one of the biggest. Yes. Um, wonderful uh, things and, and greatest learning experiences and great privilege yes. to connect with adoptees to oh just my sit God. back and listen and be like, wow, okay, there's so much that we share, but there's so much nuance about yes. each other's situations that we need to learn in order to advocate for one another properly. Well, because, and this is something that I, I'm very, they the one, the adoptee community is like, they're 10 steps ahead of us yes. in terms of like understanding um, you know, the psychological impacts that this can have on you, you know, mm -hmm. understanding how the adoption industry works. Yes. There's a lot about that that we can understand, like also how the infertility industry works. Exactly. How, so really being able to like sit and talk with adoptees has been just the biggest fucking gift. Mm -hmm. But also our two, we are essentially, as I like to say, is our two communities are like, we're, we're both, we're both siblings yeah. of the same parent of the baby business we are products of the baby business yes and what our community does affects the adoptee community yes. and so for me i'm a big believer that we need to be hand in hand with the adoptee community marching together yes. as we gain rights because what will happen is as the infertility industry gets more and more regulated as it should mm -hmm. As it should. Yep. What's going to end up happening is more people are going to pour into the adoption industry. Yeah. We need to ensure that they are getting regulations as well. So it's not like we're just taking all of this um, demand and pouring it back into another unregulated exactly. industry. And that's how adoptees feel too. They don't yeah. want to tell parents to, well, don't adopt, so just use donor conception. And I think- They don't the, want to do that, know, yeah. But yes, no, I, I, I do the camaraderie that we have now, and we are actively still developing with the adoptee community, I do think is, I think that is the secret to both of our communities' success is working together. Yes. Um, I do think that together we're looking at it as tackling the baby industry. Yeah. I do think we'll bring both of our communities a lot of success. And, you know, when adoptee legislation comes on the ballot, I do expect donor conceived people to be lining oh, up yes. to support your adoptee. Your adoptee, absolutely. Your our adoptee community open up access to birth certificates, original birth certificates. One, oh. yeah, 
for all my donor conceived people who, because I do see you in the chat rooms a lot, and I try actively to, to, because I see a lot of them going like, you know, I should have never existed. They should, my parents should have just adopted. That does not help the conversation. Please do not stop. Adoptees are in a in a you know different boat, but similar boat as to where we are. Please don't do that to them. They they deserve the same amount of understanding, empathy that that we one hundred percent. No, absolutely not. We're in this together. Yep, exactly. Oh, my God. Uh, I Okay, okay. I know that, like, I could continue talking to you for easily another oh, couple hours. I know really I could. could. We could. We really could. We really could. We drove back from Louisville together for how yes. many hours? That was 12 hours? <laughs> Something crazy like that, yes. But I'm trying to... Um, so I would say, okay... I, I, I do know how I'd like to end this. <laughs> okay. I do know how I'd like to I end this. I trust you. I trust you. Okay. Um, there was a, it was a snapshot of a conversation. It was a, it was a, a screenshot of a conversation with a, a recipient parent. Mm-hmm. And they were, I don't know anything about the recipient parent. Please understand, I, I have no information. Yeah. I just know that they are a future recipient parent. Okay. And... They were saying, they were in our comment section going like, you guys are absolutely fucking insane. I have a donor conceived child. And they're like, it's not your donor. It was my donor. My child is going to know their donor conceived, but it will mean nothing to them. We are their family. It will mean nothing. And the kid is like, I think three is what we sort of got. Now... That was recent. That was, I think, within this week that 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 comment happened. And I do think that that is now a lot more of, like, I would say the toxicity of the recipient parents is saying, yeah, I'll tell them, but it's going to mean nothing to them. Like, fuck all of you guys. And they're not going to turn out like you because all of you found out late and that's the only reason you're upset. So I would, as the person who is so just knowledgeable on our industry and what people have gone through – to the recipient parents who do have that frame, yeah. that framework, what would you, I would say, in your amazing Cassandra, evergreen, kind way? Oh my goodness! Advise this is, them. This is how I got to be a moderator and admin for the the big recipient parent group is because apparently when I write things that I think might be slightly mean, people tell me that they're nice. But so uh, <laughs> I can't imagine you ever saying anything mean. Okay, <laughs> it take it takes a lot. It really, does. that's what I need to do. I need to send my shit to you and be like, Cassandra, I need you to Cassandra this up because right now it's too glorified, and I need you to like, I need you to like chill this out a little bit. <laughs> You know, something like that. And I think that's the level that shame has moved. It's not always the shame at disclosure anymore. It's it's there's a lot of, you know, pride in in having families of different structures and telling people that you're used donor conception, having your child know, most importantly, from birth, from before birth, talk to your baby bump, you know, all of that. Um, So there's a lot of a lot of. progress in that realm. Mm -hmm. I think the area where there's still shame is in a comment like that is indicative of of the area where that still harbors shame, which is that this topic or this area of your child's life will somehow still be integral to who they are. Mm. And I think a lot of people, a lot of parents think that our entire lives revolve around donor conception. And of course, as we were well, saying, for you and for, I, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. this has become my career now. So yes, but you know, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I have a seven year old daughter. I have tons of interests. I do lots of things that you know, talk to any of my friends who know me outside of this. I am a weird, wacky, fun person to know, aside from this, even if I never mentioned this. Um, we have other lives. We have yeah. friends and family and stuff. And um, Yes, I'm very into gardening, just, yes. Yay! So I, I do have other pieces <laughs> to my personality. Right. And so I think when you explain it to parents, they're so afraid because when we're talking to them about this, yes. this is what we're talking about. So they see it as all we're doing is emphasizing the importance of the the, the you know uh, genetic parent who is who had donated their gametes, um, when really it's just that we just have to um, because that's what we're missing. So we need to raise awareness that it does matter to some extent. Um, it's not, but it, it isn't the only thing that matters. So it's it's more about for a comment like that. It's about saying. 
your child has so many aspects of their personality. Some are inborn, some will be developed, some you shape, some you don't shape. And we this also is oh, one of the, oh, sorry. No, 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 you're no, fine. No, no, as I say, and we don't know the impact of genetics yet. We don't. We I mean, don't. it's so I, new I, still I, for us. I love to say this as, as a parent, like when I was pregnant, like, you know, you can't just like point at your, you know, I I, I, I like to say stomach. My daughter corrects me to uterus because I also have a uterus in here, actually. Let me I love that your daughter. No, yeah. You know, my daughter. Uh, for my, all of you who are just listening, I just got handed a uterus plushie and it makes me so happy. My daughter is very anatomically correct now because she knows my story because I, you know, kind of practiced with her telling her my conception story. Okay, know? why do the ovaries, though, look like mice? They're very, it's, I know. Right? They've got this ears. Looks like a, it, why do the ovaries have ears? It's very strange. This is not anatomically They need to correct. listen to the sperm coming. Like, they need I, to listen to the, I'm just saying we're talking about like anatomically yeah. correct. This is not what I I believe. Yeah. Unless I really miss the ear lesson. But when you're looking at your, you know, your growing belly, your growing uterus, you know, you don't say like, I want you to look like me or I want you to look like or to have this oh, there, aspect there are, of my personality. There are some parents they who do want say that. that. There they are do some, some parents who do say yes, that. Yes, yes, yes. But once you have that child, you know you can't control certain aspects. You can't control who they look like. They could come out looking exactly like your spouse or like the donor or like whoever. Like you can't control the way the genetics fall. Oh, the amount of donor can see people mm -hmm. who end up looking like their donor. I know. Yes. Oh, more than the raised kids sometimes. Yes. It's crazy, you know? Yes. And so that's what I, that's, that's kind of what I would approach that parent as saying is like, this is just one aspect of your child's identity and you just need to hold space for whatever meaning that will have for them because it might have a smaller meaning. Some kids we know from the, from the groups, some kids start asking really in-depth questions at like three years old. Yep. Really in-depth questions. Oh, yeah. And some, some kids are in their twenties and they still haven't, haven't uh, shown much interest. So, and, and that's not always something that you can control. You may try, but just like anything else about a person's identity, Anything else, your sexuality, your uh, gender identity, your likes, your food preferences, God, anything. Some of those things we just cannot pound into our children, regardless of how much we uh, might want to, 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 to guide them a certain way. And I feel like the importance of, of the, the, the donor, the genetic parent, or the uh, level to which they feel um, an affinity or something missing is not always something that a parent can control yeah. with their, um, I was gonna say like with their rhetoric, but that's not really the right word, but with their, with their, you know, with their language or with their guidance, you can't always, so you really need to leave the language open um, for your child to express curiosity or yeah. not. But the way you allow your child to express their feelings is by leaving that space open, by mm -hmm. talking about it, and by letting the kid know that they can talk about the hard parts and maybe the the happy parts of being donor conceived. You know, they can feel like they have a really unique origin story, which might feel really cool to them at certain points in their life, and at other points in their life, it might not feel cool to them. Um, it says it might a lot be of painful. You know, I mean, I used to. I mean, this this tells you how much I I socially how graceful I was and still am to this day. I used to tell people that I was a sperm donor baby at college parties as a way of flirting because I thought I was like, oh, this is cool. This will get the boys running. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. It does make a good story. I mean, that uh, it says way more about me. <laughs> I mean, I'm like looking back and like, oh, that's there are reasons why I was single for a very long time. That's, <laughs> that's why, Laura, like. Let me see. I my my ways of of I'm like this is how I'm gonna attract a partner was uh, learning devil sticks, close up card magic, and I'm a sperm donor baby. That was my tactics. <laughs> that was my great plan. Your dream wife. <laughs> I am. <laughs> like it, it was it was a long road. It was yeah. a long road. Yeah. And I I I I fully I still commit. I'm still like no nah, that that was that was me being myself. Yeah. But no, it was definitely like. But it's it's you being it's being yourself, and it's not yeah. always something that that people can shape for you. It's it's who you turn. My out parents to be. would have not guessed that in a thousand years. Yeah, they they would have been like yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's not you know it's really not always um, early disclosure doesn't solve 
everything. It really we no. know we know that from adoption. It does. We just know that from adoption. And yeah. love helps, but love doesn't solve um, the desire for information and answers and yeah. connection. And it doesn't mean that that person has to um, be the everyday raising parent, but it, it means that there needs to be some kind of um, valuing that part of your child's identity. That way they value that part of themselves also, and they don't look at it as a foreign alien part. I think a lot of us, I, yeah. I certainly felt very alien. I thought for, for much of my life that I was somehow not human or somehow oh. very, very wrong for the world. Um, I, it wasn't, yeah. you know, some people think they don't fit in their family. I never felt yep. that way so much. I've just felt more like I didn't fit in the world. Like there was mm -hmm. something very, very, very wrong with me. Um, and I didn't know what it was. And I don't need, obviously this isn't the only thing. Um, I'm, <laughs> oh, there's lots wrong with me. No, but I mean, but I, but when you uncover a secret like this and you realize how much family uh, secrets and stuff has, has shaped you, yes. you, you, you kind of realize that that, that kind of lends a sense of, of self blame and yeah. self, there must be something wrong with me that I don't feel like a part of me is, is accepted or, um, Okay. Kids will internalize shame yeah. so fast and so quick. And it's why we encourage recipient parents to be like, tell them immediately, tell them it's good, tell them it's okay. Tell them that you will go on this path with them. Uh, tell them multiple times. Yeah. Because it's like, I'm when, when you're using the phrase like the donor conception will mean nothing to them, it's literally half of their DNA, guys. Yeah. It's half of who they are it's, i'm sorry yeah. maybe maybe it won't mean anything to them yeah. but you can't make that choice for your child no. the, every time you look in the mirror every it's time you every, look in the mirror. everything i really felt like i was kind of like violated on like a cellular level yeah. like this, this person is in every cell of my body mm -hmm. and i don't know who he is he's like invaded you know and yes. and and granted again like the, the the sudden trauma the sudden onset of that kind of trauma is from late discovery but i can imagine had i known from childhood still feeling that way within my own skin of yeah. feeling like i don't know who's in me um and you know it, you know some kids are more existentially minded than others and some will will you know yeah. the parents need to say it's okay if you're angry at me or sad at me for for this i mean that's something i i've learned with my daughter just in general it's okay to tell kids that that they can be mad at you for something that you've said or done you know it, kids are not your property they're not yeah. an extension of you they are their own sentient beings and you need to allow them to be that way yeah I know for me, a big part of my morning is m with my siblings. Yeah. That's all I wanted as a kid was I wanted siblings. Aww. All I wanted. I literally begged my parents. Yeah. And now coming to find out, I totally do have siblings. Yeah. And one of the first things, and I, I'm never going to probably find all of my siblings. Yeah. And to find, and when I first connected with like my one of my older sisters, and one of the first things she said was, I'm so angry that everyone stole this time from us. Exactly. We could have had each other our entire lives. Exactly. And I literally was texting her the other day, just going like, "Hey, I love you." And it yes. was, and she's just like, "I love you." And I tell all my, I tell all my friends about my funny little sister and her running around in a sperm suit, and the fact That's that it was best. like my older, my big sister was saying that was yeah. just like, I could have had fucking this. I could have had this. It's so my entire hard life. to integrate when Her you're older. Her and I could have yep. always had this. That's why parents now, at least we can say, our parents just didn't know yeah. better. But now parents have all that information at their fingertips. You in yes. online in books, it's there. It's it is there. available. It wasn't available for our parents, right. and that is a, a point of I would say sympathy. Yes, absolutely. That I do have. Uh, I mean, to an extent, your 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 parents. Still yes, have, yes. I have like, I have I, empathy. I, I, I do. You know, parents still yes. should have told you. Like like, uh, like uh, exactly. Even for that time, they still should have known better. <laughs> yes. But. I have empathy for those parents, mm -hmm. but the parents nowadays, I'm like, guys, it's all out there. We're so exactly. accessible. We're so available. Um, I message, I, I get recipient parents messaging me almost every single day, and I try and message as many of them back as I possibly You're so can. Good. Well, I try. Um, and because it's it's like, look, if they're reaching out to me, yes. 
Mm-hmm. I'm gonna, I'm gonna fucking water. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna fertilize. The, I'm gonna. We're, 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 we're because the industry helping. needs to help them more. And it's also like we are. Uh, yes, I, I, you know, I am live or die donor conceived, pe- mm-hmm. donor conceived people. But I do consider donors and recipient parents part of our community. Absolutely. And the more we welcome into our community, the better it will be long for the long haul. Because mm-hmm. we want, we want the best for the next generation. We, and we want and, and their and their families as a yeah. whole. We want their. We want healthy families, um, open, honest families yes. with communication and healthy. I, I want, I want you yeah. to be your your mommy, daddy, parent self. Like I want you, I want donor conception to work in an ethical way, and I want you to have your family. I want you to be happy, and I want it all to go well, and I want your happy to be this happy donor conception family. I want that for you. Yeah. Yeah. I totally do. And we can do it. It just you you do have to face some some of your own demons. You got to face those insecurities, which I I know suck. I'm not saying that that isn't small, and I understand that it is. But it will be okay when we do talk to donor-conceived people whose parents were supportive of them their entire life. You, the donor-conceived person's like, yeah, well, yeah, well, it's cool. Like that, you you do see the difference. You do you see the difference, and you might still say, I'm angry that I was intentionally separated from this part of my family, but. My parents made an effort to keep me connected to that part. So there, you know, there may still be anger at the at the practice and how it's done. Oh, yeah. But you can keep those connections there and intact. Yeah. By keeping that openness in your conversations with your child and in those relationships and considering those people your your child's family or, you know, considering them I you know, one recipient parents likens it to like the, they're your in-laws in a yeah. sense, you know, because they're genetically related to your child, not to you. But so you have to kind of welcome them as part of your yeah. extended family as well. And that was really how we create like full, healthy identity in in donor conceived people, valuing all parts of who they are. I mean, I love talking to donor conceived people who had like a known donor and it was like a family friend. It was an uncle and it was like it was just somebody who was always part of their life. Yeah. And they were like, Y'all didn't have this? <laughs> yes. They're like, what? You mean you didn't know your 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 donor? You didn't have an Uncle Bob? Like, what? And you you hear that, and then you see the horror on their face. They're like, oh, shit, this is sad. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, oh, I'm so sorry for you, bud. Yes. <laughs> and it is, and you see the difference. And you're there yeah. just like, yeah, ah, yeah, yeah, that sucks. We want we want more of that. We want to yeah. keep moving in that, in that direction. Because right it's way. not going anywhere, you know? No, so, it's not. No, it's it's here to stay. So let's make it as ethical as we can. True. Well, Cassandra, thank you for the um, thank you for for not just bringing the um, uterus with the ovaries that look like mice and the egg and the and the sperm with the little bows on it. Um, thank you for one for coming. Thank, uh, you. thank you for doing this. Thank you for your vulnerability. Thank you for sharing your story because. Uh, as horrifying as your story is, the most horrifying part is knowing that you your story is not unique. Exactly. There are other donor can see people who went through the same thing, and it's so important for them to hear that. Yeah. Thank you for your ongoing work with being there for donor conceived people, um, not just in the chat rooms and being supportive, but the active work that you're doing working with the industry to try and like get them to huck a buck and move forward as they should. Uh, because honestly, if there was going to be anybody in that room talking to the industry, I would want it to be you. Hands down. Thank no, you. Thank I you. would want it to be you. And Absolutely. I'm, and I'm going to I'm going to quote my biological father here and something that we both would say, whatever situation we happen to be in. I just want to help. <laughs> I just want to help I people. Just want to help. I just want to help people. And that is basically my uh, life uh, 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 mantra, and it's basically his life mantra, which is sort of how genetics I, how, are strong, and it's also kind of how I came to be. Yeah, because he wanted to. It's help. You, you see, we see that circle of life there. I know, I know. All right, well, thank you again, thank you again, and thank, thank you to you, all of our listeners. And is there anything that our listeners can do to support your work? Or oh anything my goodness! Like that. Is there anything? I'm always open to uh, friend requests on Facebook and Instagram. Um, Cassandra J. Adams on Instagram. Um, 
and I help admin the uh, big group on Facebook, uh, Donor Conceived Best Practices. You can uh, join there to um, if you are in any way connected to the Donor Conception Constellation, um, and just you know, just follow me, support the more. Uh, honestly, I, I I just I love everybody, and the people who I have connected with on this journey have uh, really provided me with some of the. Um, emotional and physical fortitude to, to do a anything that I do, because I just, I just, I just want people to know they're not alone. And I just want people to, to be able to, um, if I can help, help anybody feel that way, then, then I've done, I've done something. So hopefully that, that's, that's my goal. So yes, anybody who wants to uh, connect, if you found out that you're Jewish or you thought you were Jewish and found out you weren't, um, any kind of, of, of anything like that, I'm always, I'm always open. I might take a while to respond, but I'm open. Well, thank you, Cassandra, and thank you again to our listeners. Everybody, please go have a delightful day. Go have a drink of water. Go take your nap. Go play outside. Go, you know, with permission, pet a dog. Um, if you have your own dog, you know, obviously pet it with consent. Um, and go, go be awesome. And please, if you are a donor-conceived ally, please also be an adoptee ally. Absolutely, 100%. All right, thank you all so much and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye.